Good morning. <sighs> Tis the season to be merry. Well, that's my name. All right. Our text this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11. Uh, I will be reading verses 1 through 19. Now, when Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, He went on from there to teach and proclaim his message in their cities. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to Jesus, Are you the one who is to come? Or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered John's disciples, Go. And tell John what you see and hear. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised. And the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. As John's disciples went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? Someone dressed in soft robes? Look, those who wear soft robes are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written, see, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist, yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John came. And if you're willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. Let anyone with ears listen. But to what will I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We wailed and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the year 18 of our common era, the Tetrarch, Herod Antipas, moved his capital city from Sephoris. It it was a city, a town about four miles north of Nazareth, and I probably butchered the name, but he moved it from Sephoris to the western shores of the Lake of Galilee. It was there on those shores of Lake Galilee that Herod built a port city, And he named it in honor of the Roman emperor. He called the city Tiberius. Jesus would have likely been a teenager around this time, and his family would have been fully aware of, if not affected by those events. The city of Tiberius quickly became a major commercial hub on the shores of the lake. Herod was able to encourage residents to populate the city. He created a market probably for salted fish or other fish products that could be distributed throughout the empire, a way to gain notoriety, maybe even wealth. It was a strategic move for Herod. Herod is a crafty fox, after all. He was likely attempting to gain favor from Emperor Tiberius and perhaps trying to expand his own power to match that of his own father, Herod the Great. Herod the Great held the title of king back in his day, and Herod Antipas was just a tetrarch, which means quarter ruler. 
His region of rule was literally about one-fourth the size of his father's, and he wanted to expand that rule. Another way in which Herod Antipas wanted to gain favor with the emperor is that he had some new coins minted. You can see some of these if you looked them up. On one side of the coin, there's a wreath with Tiberius, the emperor of Rome, his name inscribed on it. And on the other side of the coin was the image of a reed. A reference to the reeds that grew on the shores of Lake Galilee and likely became a symbol for his new capital city. Those coins with the image of a reed and the names of Herod and Tiberius inscribed on them, they would have naturally been used in everyday trade. They would have been distributed as payment to fishermen who sold their catch in the city of Tiberius. They also would have become the means by which the people of that region were required to pay taxes with. Herod's activity and the effect that it had on the region was probably a significant influence on how Jesus himself started his own ministry. In Matthew chapter 4, you go back there and you read that it was after having spent 40 days in the desert and after hearing that John the Baptist had been put in jail by Herod, Jesus leaves his hometown in Nazareth and goes to Capernaum another city that sits on the shores of Lake Galilee, just north of Tiberias. We know from the gospel story that most of Jesus' closest followers were fishermen. It makes you wonder, why does this carpenter's son slash rabbi go to a lake town and befriend a bunch of fishermen? And why would those fishermen follow him? We don't know the precise effect that Herod's trade had on the local economy, but I think we can assume that Herod's primary motivation for this system sat on a throne in Rome. Herod's other activities, as recorded in history, seem to indicate that his primary motivation was to please Roman emperors and expand his own power. That meant that the people who sat under Herod's rule like those fishermen who followed Jesus. They've likely had to orient a lot of their own social and economic life towards those aims as well. There may have been some Jews who prospered in that environment. Some probably did not, especially if they were laborers. Those people probably had to toil in an economy that was less about supporting their own life and happiness, their own capacity to thrive and was more about glorifying an emperor and elevating Herod's influence. There's one scholar who talked about an archaeological finding from that period. It's an old fishing boat that's dated from the first century. It had been abandoned in the lake. The scholar noted that the boat seemed to have been patched multiple times by ten different types of wood. That is, it was likely being patched from whatever scraps those fishermen could find because they could not afford to renovate the boat with the original materials. Life for many people in that region was likely a grind. One of their own was set over them as ruler, yet Herod had more in common with Roman occupiers than the common people. He certainly did not have their best interest in mind, I like to imagine that the disgruntled people of that region referred to Herod as the Reed King because of the image he put on his coins. Herod was a Jew, but he seemed to take on a lot of the customs of Roman elite. I don't imagine many of the common people thought too well of Herod. So when Jesus asked the people why they went out to the desert to see John the Baptist, he takes an opportunity to take a shot at Herod. Did you go out into the desert to see a reed shaken by the wind? Or someone who sits in a palace in soft robes? That is, when the people went out to hear John, they did not go out to see someone who was benefiting from the current way of doing things and doing so at their expense. No, they went out to see a prophet, 
They went to see someone who spoke on behalf of God. Yet John was more than a prophet. He's the one that God had sent to prepare the way for a new way of doing things, a new age. The current order, the order of Herod and Caesar, is passing away. God is doing a new thing. So you can imagine John back in his day gathering the people of Israel out in the desert to prepare them for, to fulfill their return from exile, to reclaim their homeland, to reclaim their life, their ability to thrive. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Don't say to yourselves, we are, pe- we are children of Abraham. God is able to raise from these stones children of Abraham. Instead, bear fruits worthy of repentance. This is a key point of context for a story this morning. John the Baptist's ministry is marked by his strong opposition to Herod. John criticizes Herod, saying that his marriage is in violation of Torah. And like the rest of Israel, Herod must repent and help prepare the way. Of course, Herod does not appreciate John's criticism of his marriage or John's calls to help prepare the way for the Lord. According to Herod, Herod is Lord, at least of that region. So Herod puts John in jail, hoping to stifle any opposition. Herod, though, holds off on killing John because John is popular among the people. They regard him as a prophet. So it's interesting that the disciples of John the Baptist approach Jesus in our story, but also in an instance before Matthew. They approach him to question him about his ministry and his identity. First, in chapter 9, the disciples of John go and ask Jesus why he does not require his disciples to fast like they and the Pharisees do. John and his disciples are concerned that Jesus and his disciples are not disciplined enough in their practice. They might have also been concerned because Jesus has been hanging out with tax collectors Jesus had just asked one tax collector, Matthew, to follow him. Jesus acknowledges to them that he doesn't require his disciples to fast, and he has indeed become a friend of those tax collectors and sinners. Because he does not fast, and because he hangs out with questionable company, he has earned a reputation, fairly or unfairly, for being a glutton and a drunkard. Jesus' behavior does not look like the kind of repentance that John preached about or even embodied in the desert. John went out to the desert to form an alternative community, to differentiate from this polluted world. Jesus seems to be mingling with it a little bit too much. In our story this morning in Matthew 11, once again, John's disciples approach Jesus They question him, are you the one who is to come or should we wait for another? At Jesus' baptism, John clearly recognizes Jesus as the Messiah, but now John is unsure. John doubts Jesus. See, John took a stand against Herod, and it cost him. He's sitting in Herod's prison because of his stand. He has sacrifice for the way of God. And while sitting in prison, he's hearing about Jesus' ministry. He's hearing that Jesus is mingling with these sinners. He's hearing that Jesus is not disciplined in his practices. John has doubts about Jesus. He wonders if Jesus is indeed the one they are waiting for. See, John's own ministry carried a healthy dose of judgment with it. He took to heart the prophetic words of Malachi chapter 3, which says that the one who prepares the way for the day of the Lord, he will come and refine and purify the people with soap and fire. Those are metaphors for purification. Those of us who have lived in religious communities know those metaphors well. 
In Matthew chapter 3, John uses similar language to describe the Messiah's ministry. John expects the Messiah to be one who will baptize the people with the Holy Spirit with fire. He says the Messiah will have a winnowing fork in his hand, ready to separate chaff from wheat. Again, these are themes of purification, judgment, making hard distinctions, black and white distinctions between the righteous and the sinners. However, Jesus' ministry has not turned out the way that John expected. Jesus' ministry has focused on healings, exorcisms, public banquets with tax collectors and sinners. In other words, Jesus is really strong on healing and restoration and inclusion, but a little weak on hard judgment. With Jesus, we don't see a lot of vindication of the righteous in the face of the Herods and transgressors of this world. So as John sits in Herod's prison, awaiting his own death, you may be wondering when the liberation of God's people from oppression will really take place. So far, the rule of Rome and Herod remains undisturbed. John is looking for the kingdom of God, the governance of God to break in and take over. John gave his life for this. His commitment to the kingdom of God cost him his own freedom. He sacrificed, and here's Jesus eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners. Some of us may have similar questions about Jesus. It's been 2,000 years. Our basic confession is that Jesus is Lord, yet our world is still marked by violence and exploitation and greed. Why does it seem that the Herods and Caesars of the world are still in charge? Why do they seem to prosper when others suffer? Why do I keep giving my life for this? Is Jesus really the one sent by God? Or should we wait for another? Go and tell John what you see and hear. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. But to what will I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplaces. They're calling to one another. We played the flute for you, but you didn't dance. We wailed. You didn't mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. He's mad. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. They say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, he's immoral. Yet wisdom, in the end, is vindicated by her deeds. You know, sometimes I wonder if I'm making all of this a little bit harder than it needs to be. I keep waiting on the world to change, but I wonder if what really needs to change is how I see and how I hear. Advent is a season where the call to action is to be on watch, to watch, be vigilant. Watch for the love and the joy, the peace of God's kingdom to break into our world. It's important to learn to watch. I'm a doer. I like doing. It's hard for me to sit back and watch and wait but we have to learn how to watch. We have to learn how to see. We have to learn how to discern the work of God among us. Sometimes that watch will lead us into mourning, into grief, 
as we watch and wait, we lament that the world is not as it should be. That's not hard to see if you're looking for it. Sometimes, though, it's so overwhelming that we will slip into denial. But a life of faithfulness is one that knows how to lament and grieve. Because there are things in this world worth grieving. We lament injustice and depravity. We lament indignity and suffering. We lament greed and idolatry. We lament violence in our world's cycle of warfare. We lament the scapegoating of marginalized communities. We lament the despair of God's children who long for justice and love and belonging. And we do this because we are people of hope. We hope for something better. We hope for the fullness of God's promises to come to fruition in our world. And we watch for those promises. And as we watch, I think there's also going to be moments where we will dance. And we should. There are signs of God's kingdom breaking into our world, and that should bring us joy. Go and tell John what you see and hear. Look to the signs. Look at the fruits. Wisdom is vindicated by our deeds. Do you see people among you finding freedom and joy? Do you see people finding peace with themselves? Do you see marginalized people finding a place of belonging? Do you see people finding wholeness and healing? Do you have a taste of that in your own life? If you do, then the kingdom of God is among you. It may not be here in its fullness, but it is here. Even if it is just partial, it is still tangible, it is still real. And it may not be exactly what you expected when you initially gave your life for this cause. It certainly was not what John expected. And in some ways, I'm sure John took offense. It's no fun to be the one who's offended. It cuts you off from the capacity to be a part of the joy. I know I've wasted too much of my life being like those children in the marketplace wondering when God is going to act, when the work of God is right there in front of me. The Herods of the world will dismiss it. Indeed, they will feel threatened. They will work to shut it down. Religious authorities will take offense. They'll think it's juvenile, irresponsible, maybe even unholy, immoral. There are always going to be people who try to take the kingdom of God with violence. Behavior management, control tactics, fear mongering. But you know a tree by the fruit it bears. It may feel risky to be a part of God's kingdom breaking into our midst. But the greater risk is missing out. Missing out on the joy of the promise missing out on the gifts that are unfolding right in front of us. Again, wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. But we have eyes to see. But we have ears to hear. Watch and wait. What do you see? What do you hear? Amen.